see nobody here. And then I'm late for a meeting at Santa Cruz, Washington, Santa Cruz, yeah. Glad to share. The city of Capitola is starting its meeting. Uh, let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 We've already um, noted that everyone's present on the city council, as you can see, uh, before the start of the uh, closed session. Uh, today's meeting is broadcast live on Charter Communication, and the technician involved is Lynn Dutton. It'll be rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel uh, 71, and also on Wednesday 8 p.m. on Saturday. Okay, so we have some presentations recognizing uh, some volunteers of our advisory groups. Um, one of the strengths of Capitola is we have so many people that do volunteer and we're all very grateful and I'm sure everyone that volunteered was very happy to do so. So, Linda, please. Yes, we have um, members from a number of committees. Um, please feel uh, join us up front. Um, I'm gonna read the names of everyone. Not all were able to uh, join us, um, but for the Commission on the Environment, we had Megan Sixt from the Finance Advisory Committee. Peter Wilk and Will O'Sullivan. From the Library Advisory Committee, Ariel Gray, Tony Campbell, Gail Ortiz, Lisa Steingrube, and Stephen Walsh. Planning Commissioners, Linda Smith, Sam Story, and Susan Westman. And from the Traffic and Parking Commission, Ron Burke, Karen Hanna, Melanie Arau, Molly Ording, Steve Ross, Nels Westman, Willie Case, Doug Tom, and Don Gra Ron Graves, sorry Ron. Molly, thanks for all you doing. Okay. You know, I'm good. Longer than I've been in town, you've been on that committee. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Sue. We'll be back again. Thank you. So while well, everyone who just got their reward reports to the uh, bar downtown, no, you're going to stay. That's good. So let's have a report from closed session. Reed. Yes, we had one item for discussion with the council and one potential case, significant exposure to potential litigation. Council received a status update and took no reportable action. Thank you very much. Do we have any additions and deletions to the agenda? None. 
Okay, now's the time for public comment. Um, you have three minutes to give a talk or a, a comment as you see fit uh, on any item that's not on our agenda today. No comments? Bring it back to the board. Any city council or staff comments? I do. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to report out that I attended the League of Cities, I think it was last week, and I really enjoyed myself. City manager Jamie was able to attend with me, and I was able to learn a lot, so thank you. Good for you. Yeah, thanks. I have nothing. You have nothing. I was going to take your thunder, but I guess not. Okay. I have no thunder. None? None? Nope. Okay. Well, I, I thought the chair of the RTC would uh, comment on what the RTC just voted on. Go ahead. You're the you're the city council representative. Oh, okay. So we're going ahead with phase two on the RTC. So that means that the um, carrier will be able to do um, commercial and also plan to do the movement of people, some sort of mass transit um, option. And that is all to be decided. Uh, the main programs that are going to be worked on are the things that are pertinent to Highway One, the merge lanes, uh, bicycle improvements, um, other signage and uh, signaling improvements and stuff like that, which will have immediate impact on helping to move uh, um, traffic in this area. So the other issues with the train, the corridor and stuff like that, that's going to take some time. So that was just determined last week. So do we have any um, boards, commissions, appointments? Yes, we have one. The Art and Cultural Commission met last week um, and has two recommendations. One is a reappointment of Roy Johnson um, as the arts professional, and then we have Susan McPeak is recommended to join as an at-large member. And so this is just a um, concurrence vote. Okay, so moving along, um, we have a consent calendar. Do we, we need, need a, a vote? Motion. Do you need a motion? Yeah. yeah. We don't yeah. need a vote. Oh, yes, we do. Excuse yeah, me. Please. I'm sorry about that. I move that we appoint Susan McPeak to the Art and Cultural Commission. I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions? No. Okay. So let's move on to the consent calendar. Um, any items on the consent calendar that City Council would like to remove and vote on later? Anyone from the public that would like to remove an item from the consent calendar? Seeing none, and bring back to the board. Is there I a motion? Move consent calendar. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Moving along to item 10, general government public hearings. We have to consider a letter of support to the uh, for the SoCal Water District district uh, uh, district uh, grant application. So, is there a report from the city manager? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, <clears throat> the item before you this evening is to consider supporting a grant application for the Soquel Creek Water District's Project Pure Water. Uh, Project Pure Water, which uh, general manager for the Water District will be able to explain far more uh, eloquently than I, was is essentially a project that would take um, treated effluent from Santa Cruz, which currently is discharged into the Monterey Bay uh, National Marine Sanctuary, and about 25% of that would be transported back here, given further treatment, and then to the point of uh, pure water, and then injected into the groundwater basin to provide a buffer to prevent further seawater intrusion. So the item before you today is to authorize the mayor to sign a letter supporting the district's grant application. I believe the amount is a $50 million grant application. And we have Ron Duncan, general manager for the water district here to answer any questions or provide additional information. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, wow, I'm impressed, Jamie. That was a good summary. Um, <laughs> you did, did excellent. I wanna thank the council members. I know you got a lot on your plate. And over the a couple of years, you've, you've really put yourself out there to learn about the water issues, meeting with different people and, and bringing us to your council. Uh, uh, council Member Brooks was even a graduate of our first Water Academy, so thank you. Big endeavor, especially while you're running for election. That was huge to do double duty like that. Uh, it really speaks well of the council here. As you know, we have a big problem, right? We've been branded by the state to be one of the top 21 worst basins in the, uh, in the state, critically overdrafted. Innovative study recently showed it's not only a bad case, it's worst case scenario with seawater intrusion invading our aquifers. So the district has a solution. Jamie described it well. It's to take 25% of the treated affluent that goes out to the Monterey Bay Sanctuary, purify it, recharge the groundwater basin, create an iron curtain so seawater can't come in and ruin our aquifers. 
a statistical survey uh, that we conducted, a uh, valid survey, showed that 77% of the people in the community support uh, recycled water, this type of project, when they're educated about it. A recent survey, or I don't know how recent, but pretty recent, uh, by Santa Clara Valley Water District showed that 84% of the people in their community uh, support using recycled water versus taking more from the streams or the groundwater aquifer. So you, you, have, you have the will of the people behind you. But not only that, the state and federal government is also believes in this project. They've awarded us over $2 million, state and federal combined. And recently, the state was down here uh, to see what our project was about. So we took them on a field trip, showed them around, took them around Capitola. We have a monitoring well up there. And they said, we're the model project for this type of uh, endeavor to prevent seawater intrusion. So they invited us back. They said, we got money set aside. They actually changed the rules of engagement for the grant uh, and invited us back to apply for a $50 million grant. So we're in the midst of that. And so that is the ask in front of you tonight is a letter of support to uh, help obtain that 50 million, which would translate into lower rates for your customers. And I'm happy to answer any questions, but. Well, this is the time of questions to uh, Ron. Any questions? No. Um, I do have a question in terms of um, not the water rates, but in terms of um, applications for meters. Mm -hmm. uh, would you comment on that, how that might influence, uh, how this program might influence that? Are you referring specifically to our water demand offset program? Yes. Yes, that's what you're trying to get? Okay. Sure. So the water demand offset program is a program we've had uh, in place since 2003, uh, the board instituted. And it's a, it, what it does is it requires new development to offset their projected water use. And it was a balancing act because they, the board knew the aquifer was in trouble, but they know uh, development's important too. So how do you marry the two? And that program was envisioned as a bridge until we get a supplemental supply. So, you know, I think staff's hope, and I think the board's too, from what I can tell, is once we get a project online or near, you know, to that point where we know it's gonna, you know, it's, it's helping to replenish the aquifer or close to it, that that project would uh, hopefully uh, sunset. It's always, you know, in the presentations I give, it's always a bridge, water demand offset program here and uh, a new supply here and like, the water demand offset program was a bridge to a new supply just to get us by. Okay, so that helped us and uh, we might be able to release more water um, meters for the yeah. public and stuff yeah. like that. Um, I see this as a very green project. I mean, in terms of water savings, yeah. do you have any comments yeah. on that? You know, I, I'm glad you asked that. It, it, the way the, the, the board approached this project, we did a community water plan and we said, not what project do you want, but what, commu what, what community values are important to you, uh, are important to the community in a project. And so they did, they listed six values. One was environmental, one was cost, one was reliability. I won't go into the others. But this project, Pure Water Soquel, lined up on all. It's, th it's least expensive. We believe the most environmentally sound, I mean, versus taking from, you know, streams or creeks or, or groundwater or whatever. Uh, you're recycling water, so, uh, and it's drought proof. So. Uh, it met on all six of our community values. We used a science-driven approach to see which projects align with those values, and, and Pure Water SoCal popped out the top on all six. Would this project have any impact on uh, adjacent water districts? Is there any, you know, working together like you know, with uh, Santa Cruz or something? Yeah, we're working together, and, and really what we've come to see through the groundwater modeling, a very sophisticated model that uh, is being conducted and, and other uh, evidence and data is that it's not just a one one and done project kind of thing. It's we're going to need multiple sources. Santa Cruz has a different problem. They're, they rely all on surface water, so when it doesn't rain, they start to get in a world of hurt. We're all groundwater, so we believe this, the science is showing us that we need both. We need some river water when they have excess, help recharge the aquifer. Potentially, they can draw some back. You know, use it as a storage vessel. So. Uh, a lot of people seem to think they fall in love with one project. We have a saying at our office, don't fall in love with a project, fall in love with sustainability. And the ideas behind that is just sometimes when you work on something, that becomes your, your you know, what you want, but we try to keep a broad eye. And right now we do have uh, a project that we're test uh, piling to receive some water from the city of Santa Cruz. So it's a good, it's a good relationship. And for the affluent, we'll be working with city of Santa Cruz on that too. 
Okay, thank you. Um, at this point, I'm going to ask for any questions from the public. And uh, please come to the front if you have any questions of Ron or anyone else here. Okay. Um, any questions from uh, staff? Any, uh, excuse me, City Council? And uh, no questions. No, no, okay, great. S so um, at this point, we need. Okay, one question. Sorry. No, not a question. I, didn't, I thought you brought it back. I was going to make a motion. Yes, I was just going to say, time for a motion. Yeah, I, I just want to make a motion to adopt staff recommendation uh, for the uh, to authorize the mayor to sign a letter. But before that, I just want to acknowledge Mr. Duncan. Thank you for coming and giving us that presentation. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Commissioner uh, Bruce Daniels for going around. I believe he went to each and every one of us and had a, a conversation and yeah. informed us. And uh, I, I appreciate him making that effort. So yeah, and you. he's in the back just to provide moral uh, support. So you know, I, I had a good that. conversation <laughs> with the day, and I'm sure everybody had one, and that's why we probably have no questions here today yeah. and uh, feel comfortable. Yeah, with you this. have always taken time to educate yourself, so I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. So Is there a and I'll second, second the motion, and also extend my appreciations uh, to the district and Ron for bringing this project forth and uh, and educating us on the need for it. Thank you. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so there's been a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. No dissensions. Okay, moving along. Thank you very much, Ron. And Bruce, um, I appreciated your uh, explanation also. It was very thorough. Thank you. So moving along to um, item 10B, consider a contract for tax revenue consulting services. I believe um, our director, uh, Jim, will be giving a report. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. The next item before you, as you mentioned, is a considering a contract for tax revenue consulting services. Um, this comprises, there's, this is comprised of three different elements, sales tax, transit occupancy tax, or TOT, as well as cannabis tax. So I'll just briefly go over each one of those, and then we can, I can take some questions at the end. Um, sales tax, we've had a consultant that's been providing the service for 17 years. Um, sales tax is our largest revenue source for the general fund, 49%, so it's real important that we stay on top of that. Um, the, and it's changing, so with the increase of online sales and the Wayfair uh, decision, how online sales, sales tax is allocated is changing, so it's really critical that we stay on top of that and make sure that we're receiving the correct allocations. Um, HDL and Avenue are the two uh, vendors that submitted proposals. They're the two largest. I think they're the maybe the only two that provide this service in the state and most agencies within California that have a large sales tax base or have a sales tax base that makes up a large component of their general fund revenue um, contract with either one of these two firms. Um, and we've been using Avenue, which was formerly Muni Services since 2001. So Avenue purchased Muni Services in 2018 and requested that we execute a new contract with them and we looked at that as an opportunity to issue an RFP, check the market, were there other technologies out there that would improve the service or could we get better rates. Um, additionally, we weren't overly thrilled with the reports that we got from Muni Services, so that was another reason that we looked at this as an opportunity to go out and see if there was something better potentially out there. As far as the fees, they're, they're pretty um, even. Avenue Services was slightly less for the analytics and reporting, and that's the component where they take the sales tax database from the um, state of California and kind of put it into a readable format and report back to us on trends and what type of revenue we're seeing and, and what industries and all of that stuff. Um, the audit and discovery is where if they see when in their reports anomalies, either somebody's way up, way down, new, or dropped off, that could trigger an audit. And if they find new revenue for us, somebody's not paying, they take a percentage of that. They were previously, ch uh, Avenue was charging us 20% before, and now they've dropped down to 15, but that's what HDL came in at. Um, MGO is an accounting firm that only proposed on the cannabis tax, so I'll cover them at the end. Uh, the next one is the transit occupancy tax, or TOT. So just some quick stats. We have eight hotels or motels within the city. There's six property management companies that have an unknown number of rental properties under their umbrella, so that's one of the reasons I kind of want to dig into there and make sure all of those are getting captured and reported correctly. And then we have 35 owner-operated owner rental properties within the city. So we have a total of right around 50 altogether, I think. No, it's, I'm sorry, it's higher than that. It's closer to 65. Because I think there's about 20 in that second group. 
And then there's an unknown number of rentals outside of the transit rental overlay zone. So we don't receive a lot of complaints and, and our enforcement is complaint driven, but we do occasionally get complaints that somebody's renting out property outside of the zone. So um, we would like to get people to fall in compliance with our zoning code. If, uh, if approved, this will be a new service that we have not contracted for in the past. From the staff level, we have done audits. Um, a couple of years ago, my predecessor and the senior accountant audited one of the hotels on 41st Street, actually resulted in a benefit for them. They were overpaying. Um, and I believe the community development department a number of years ago had a um, intern that spent about three months doing the short-term rental um, audits. But outside of that, we don't really, we're not really staffed up to do that type of work at, at the level that we sh I think we should be. And our two specific goals are, again, making sure that the TOT is collected by the, the rental property owners and submitted correctly and accurately, and then compliance with city zoning codes. The breakdown on these fees um, and the analytics and reporting. So for Avenue, basically, we would direct them which of those properties to go audit or how we want to give them an audit plan we want to do you know 25 percent a year for four years or however that is and they charge 700 per property hdl i can do the same thing for 650 a property or they will take over the entire program where we don't do anything for 750 but that would be about 50 grand a year so i don't think we're going to jump in at 50 grand a year probably just do a couple of audits and see what we find and then kind of go from there um, the short-term rental those fees are paid as a percentage of new revenue. So similar to the sales tax, they have, uh, both, both firms have software that they can go in and they monitor Airbnb, VRBO, and those types of things and f look for properties that are renting either within the zone and not submitting or renting their property out outside of the zone. And then they um, let us know about those and then we can get them in compliance. And it's also, uh, we, on the complaint driven for the short term rental, I was talking to um, the planning department today. And when we get those complaints, we can go out there and talk to those owners and get them to stop. Mm -hmm. But there's no real penalty at this point. So we walk away and three or four days later, they're back up and renting again. So we want to kind of get a handle on, get that under control. And then the last component is cannabis tax. This is a, a new industry with the passage of Prop 64, still remains all cash, which causes a lot of concern for PD and finance department. Um, there's two components, compliance inspections, where they'll go in and they'll look at inventory management, access control, video surveillance, business records, and then financial audits where they go in and, and do basically kind of the same thing that our auditors do, um, but a little more in detail as far as looking at their point of sale system, their receipts, making sure their inventories are all accounted for and nothing's disappearing. Um, I think with this one, we definitely wouldn't uh, do any of this this fiscal year because I don't think we'll have any storefronts open. We may or may not have one up and open long enough to do this in the fall in fiscal year 1920. I think with the compliance inspections, that's the less expensive portion. A lot of that's going to be handled at least on the onset by our police department. So we probably won't use that, but I wanted it in there so we knew what, would, what it would cost if we decided to shift that over. Financial audits. I think we would do one at the close to the end of their first year of operations or maybe mid-year, pick a point in time. And then depending on how that audit went, we would either continue on an annual basis or maybe set them up to you know, a three year or a five year or whatever that, depending on how those audits go, would kind of drive how we use this service. And then the, the fees for that are substantially higher than what they are for the other services. So analytics and reporting, same type of a thing where they're just taking the records and, and, and reporting back to us. Audit and discovery is when they find things um, out there. And, and um, I'm sorry, on the audit and discovery for HDL, that includes one financial and one com compliance audit annually. And that's for two storefronts. So each store is uh, half of that 14.5. Um, with Avenue, they have a, a larger upfront as they get all the data loaded in. So I, I think part of the reason this is higher, it's new, it's all cash, it's really involved. So people aren't, the, the vendors are, don't have their system all in place. So they're still building their, their systems up. So we may be paying a little bit of a premium for getting in early, but 
it, it would be a good thing, I still think, to keep an eye on those stores as they go forward. Um, so before I hit this, Council Member Story uh, noticed that when he was reviewing it that the HDL proposal, we were 10 days beyond their 90 day guaranteed proposal. So I did email the president and CEO of, of HDL and they emailed back that they would honor their proposal in the fee. So we're okay that the fact that we're over by a few days. Okay, on good. That. Thank you for following up. Sure. So in conclusion, uh, the recommended action is to authorize the city manager to execute a three-year agreement for professional tax revenue consulting services with HDL to perform tax revenue consulting services related to sales tax, transit occupancy tax, and cannabis tax. And that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions of staff? Sam. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, Jim, thanks for speaking about the expense of the cannabis tax, because that kind of jumped out at me. It seemed extremely uh, costly. Uh, for that particular tax, but I, I guess I, in reading their proposal, and it's the new burgeoning business, all cash, I kind of um, uh, come to accept that. But um, I didn't. I is that um, fee for the cannabis tax? Is that uh, for um, uh, any number of retail? Um, units that we may have are for two? That's for two. That's for two. So if we only had one store, it would be, I think, what, 7250 or 7500 So it would be half, half of that for the first store, and then Correct. it would go to that amount. Um, OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. Um, so when we're talking about um, sales receipts and stuff like that, is there a confidentiality uh, between them and us and the public? How's that go? So we have to um, basically write a letter to the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, which used to be the DOE, and authorize HDL access to the records, to the sales tax records for the businesses that operate within Capitola, it with, which does have confidentiality. So the CDTFA won't release that data without our authorization, and they're, they have to keep all of that information confidential. Okay, it's not available to the public, the business, right. okay, got it. Um, in terms of collecting tax for the cannabis, uh, and since it's all cash, uh, how do we deal with that? It's going to be based on their receipts. So it'll be similar to TOT in where they'll have to complete, <coughs> they'll have to file a report of what they sold, what their gross receipts were, and then um, submit the tax off of that. We do the kind of the same thing with the TOT. We kind of rely, it's kind of almost an honor system where they tell us the business that they did, calculate the tax, and then we just make sure the math is right. So which is kind of why I would like to do some spot audits and just make sure everybody's accurate. So are we going to get cash? I mean, that's the thing. I mean, can they go to a bank and get a cashier's check? I mean, I just don't know how that works, that's all. For oh, the for, cannabis. for the business, the cannabis, they yeah. could write us checks. We're not all cash. It's just they, because the Somehow transactions get it within the store have to be cash, but they could deposit their money and Somehow. Sub submit okay. to yeah. us. It's just unclear to me. Okay. Jamie, do you have a comment on this? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I think one of the key things to think about here is, is that <clears throat> the, the sales tax consulting services we're, we're definitely going to use. You know, it represents 50% of our general fund. It's been a service that we've used extensively in the past to help us chart and track our sales tax and understand how it's potentially going to grow or shrink in the future. Um, the TOT and the cannabis tax, obviously we don't have a cannabis establishment yet, but we wanted to get somebody on board who was prepared to help us um, with the audits should we end up in a position where we did have a business, someone with that level of expertise. How we end up using the cannabis tax auditing services and the TOT auditing services, I think is really gonna be contingent upon how HDL performs and what we discover through the course of some of our initial audits and work. So, I guess I would really think about this in sort of two parts. One is, is this is gonna be a new partner for us with our sales tax auditing services. And then in addition, we're bringing in some additional resources to help with cannabis if we do get a retailer and hopefully an additional resource to help us with the TOT, which um, I think we could do better moving forward. But, but it's isn't a, uh, th this isn't gonna be a guaranteed open contract for three years where every we're gonna execute every single business uh, opportunity uh, that's outlined in it. Okay. And so it will all be subject to budget appropriations uh, that we make every year. I hope that's clear. I okay. A, I'm sorry, I have a question. Yes. Um, so who decide once we go into contract, you mentioned that we wouldn't um, have the consulting firm review all of our uh, 
hotels and so forth, who would decide on which ones would be audited? Since we have over 60, we wouldn't obviously afford. We would that. direct them. I would probably honestly start with the property management ones because those are the ones we have the least amount of information on. The hotels seem to be run pretty tight. The, um, I would probably put them on a rotating basis. The one that um, was done by my predecessor was the Fairfield on 41st, so they did the largest one first. Um, I would probably want to hit each hotel over a three-year period, and then the others kind of seeing how those shake out. But it's the property management ones that we don't really know how many are out there, and I just kind of want to get a handle on that. So that's probably where I would start. Mm -hmm. But I would take recommendations from the consultants since that's kind of their expertise. I, I would also add that I think that a little bit of the, the payment history would guide us in terms of the audits. Frankly, that's what triggered the audit that we did several years ago was that the payment history just didn't quite make sense when you looked at the way the numbers were coming in. Um, <clears throat> we started asking questions of their management. Their management realized that there was, you know, in the course of their own internal investigation, realized there was possible problems with it. And so the payment history, I think, is also a bit of a guide. Is, is do the payment history, does it make sense when you look at it? Is there a peak in the summer? Does it look like the peak last summer? Are the payments coming in on time? Those kinds of things uh, would be triggers for audits, I think. Okay. And, and then I had a second just question about, um, you pointed that we, we might not look into having them do the ex inspections for the, um, for the marijuana tax. And I'm just curious about, would that be an, that would be an option in the audit later? I understand that our police department would be doing the initial oversight for it, but would that still be an option in the, in the yeah, agreement here? Within their fee schedule, they broke it out. Okay. Um, we can choose one compliance audit or not. We could choose multiple compliance audits. We could do one fi um, financial or zero financial. So I just chose one compliance and one financial to kind of show okay. what I think would be worst case. Right. But with the compliance audit, that first year, a lot of that stuff, the PD is already going to be looking at. So I don't know that we need to pay an extra twelve hundred dollars. Right. Okay. Thank that you. Stuff. No, no questions. Any other questions? Okay. At this time, I'd like to ask uh, the public if there's any questions from the public. Seeing none, bring it back to the council for a motion. I'll move staff recommendation. Second. Second. I hear a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. It passes. Moving on to a. Um, and, and Mr. Mayor, one quick comment. Uh, okay. uh, Jim, I just want to thank you for taking the time to reach out for that RFP because I think that was a great opportunity for us to, to take advantage of that. So thank you for that. And I do have a question, Jim, um, if you could come back. Um, sorry. Should I refer to you as the finance director or as the Capitoli city treasurer? Finance director. Okay. But now you are the city treasurer, so. Okay. So item 10C, introduction of an ordinance amending the municipal code. And we have a presentation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, before you tonight is an update to our bicycle and PTD personal transportation device ordinance. The current one is from 1951. Just to say it's outdated is a little bit of an understatement. Um, so we're moving forward. What the biggest change is the change in technology surrounding bicycles. With the new technology of smart bicycles and bicycle shares and scooters, um, we didn't want to be the next article on the front page of the Santa Cruz Sentinel saying there's been a scooter drop in Capitola. And so we've got, we're tonight, this ordinance is to protect us from that, to make sure that any future bike share or scooter share it has a proper contract with the city. And also to update our ordinance, knowing that there's now new technology on how bicycles are parked with dockless technology and GPS systems. And so we'll be ready. So um, some of the work that's been done th this past September, we uh, reached out regarding a future bike share program for the city of Capitola. We launched a survey. There was a lot of support for a future bike share system. Um, the major points that came back in the survey were let's make sure it's safe and make sure we're prepared in terms of how these bicycles will be parked and mitigate impacts that are often associated with bike shares and also um, making sure that um, the 
we're just prepared and that the, the other part of it was the regional um, component that there was support for a regional system so I'll jump into the ordinance changes um, the first was to amend chapter 10.4 general provisions it was just to move the sections about bicycles into the bicycle section of the code and to um, get rid of outdated references uh, next under chapter 10.4 um, some of the major components of the changes to the ordinance were to add definitions, so definitions for the new technology that exist, including personal transportation devices, which include our electronic bikes and our motorized scooters, and also to bring in those new shared components, the shared mobility services. We also, there was in the um, outreach that we've done, concern for helmets, and under state law, anyone under the age of 18 must wear a helmet while riding a bicycle. Uh, we reference, we have a new reference to the state code in our, in our code. Um, one, re one requirement that has been in our code is that bicycles are prohibited on sidewalks. Under the new ordinance, it'll state that um, it prohibits both bicycles and PTDs on sidewalks. Looking into this a little bit further, in all the conversations we've had as staff, um, there is concern about children and not being able to ride their bicycles on a sidewalk. So uh, diving into that deeper today, we realize that there is some federal standards that are well, um, recommendations put out by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration stating that um, the safest place to ride your bike is on the street, but for children under the age of 10, uh, they're not mature enough to make decisions necessary to safely ride in the street. So therefore, the best practice for children under 10 would be to allow them to ride on your sidewalks. So with that, um, they're at your direction. We could modify the drafted code to say no person shall ride a bicycle or PTD on, the si on a sidewalk other than children less than 10 years of age. So simple fix for that to make sure that we're not pushing our little four-year-olds out into the, <laughs> to the busy streets. So. Um, another is, uh, other changes that occurred is that bicycle racks in the public right-of-way will require approval of a pub the Public Works Department. And also one gap that we had in our code before is we've had pedicab operators come to the city, ask how they could operate within the city, and we haven't had any type of system within our code. And we've, um, we now have a new system that they would have to come in, get a business license, and if they wanted to operate on city property, also to have an encroachment permit. Um, and also added to the code, which I mentioned, is new standards for shared mobility services. So if, um, if we were to have a bike share company come in or a scooter share, that it would have to be um, an authorized through a they'd have to have a business license and a contract with the city that's authorized by the city council. So that would come to you for authorization before they could operate. Um, we've also added new removal and impoundment standards. So in the situation where somebody leaves a bike where it doesn't belong or if there were a scooter drop off to the city, we have a means to enforce, th to impound those and um, not at our expense. So the Big changes, and this was in all the conversations that we had before um, our different committees, um, was we really need to focus in on the parking regulations. So the, the new parking standard that's drafted requires that all bicycles and PD, PTDs be parked in a bicycle rack, and then with an exception that if there is not a, a bicycle rack or um, bicycle facility within 50 feet of the trip end, then a bicycle may be parked on the sidewalks but in compliance with the following. So the first is that the, the device has to be locked, and that was a key. Um, well, I met with Claire. The tra uh, she's, she's involved with transportation at the city of Santa Cruz, so she's had a lot of um, experience with what's been going on with bike share there. And she said it, it's essential that you make sure that they have to be locked to something that's, mm -hmm. a, that's fixed to the ground. So the device is locked in an upright position to an object fixed to the ground, and that would, uh, and I'd like to fix the language to say including a sign pole or a light pole, because I don't want to leave it open to et cetera. So, um, so, 
and then all, another standard that is also included that is that in the central village, the sidewalk must maintain a five feet of clearance for pedestrian circulation and all other parts of the city it would be four feet, which is consistent with ADA. Um, also, free locking bikes shall be parked in a manner of, that complies with this section and is not hazardous to pedestrians, vehicular traffic or property and that no person shall lock, park, stand or lock a bike or a PTD to the street tree, planter box or public bench. So really those free locking bikes that they're required to follow all the regulations of a, a normal bike. Um, so my recommendation tonight is to approve the first reading of the ordinance amending municipal code title 10 vehicles and traffic to amend chapter 10.04 um, to repeal chapter 10.44 and then to adopt the new chapter 10.44 for bicycles and personal transportation devices. And I'm available for any questions. Any questions of the staff? I have a quick question. Christine? I just want a, a confirmation. I've had some questions come to me um, about whether or not we are actually approving a bike sharing service tonight. And I had said no, but I just wanted to publicly confirm that that is not what's happening right now. That is not what's Correct. happening. Thank you. Yeah, I, on the, uh, on the, uh, how you're, they're parking, I, when you go back to the first picture, there's that bar that comes out on the jump bikes now, a pretty substantial bar. Will PD or will Public Works have a override for that? Or what's, what, if somebody, if a bike is parked and it blocks something, do we have any, is there any built in mechanism how we? So you, you can actually pick up the bike from the back and move it, even though it's locked. They're extremely heavy, but you can move it. Um, I'm just saying if it's parked someplace where it's obviously an obstruction, somebody, you know, parks it in some inappropriate place, I know that the company can override that lock. I just wondered if PD or Public Works, what would be their mechanism to move a bike that was locked? So within the contract, we'll have a specific time, amount of time in which they have to um, respond to a, our, our calls, but that's a great question. I can find out if there's actually a code that we could get, because it would be very helpful. Right, I mean, if, if somebody parks their car in an obvious place, we have it towed immediately. And in, and in this case, I don't want to wait six hours, which they may think is a quick response to remove something. And I'm just wondering, if there's gotta be a way to override that and and just if you're even just gonna look into it. Yeah, and, and another um, solution would be for Public Works to have its own passcode to just to unlock it as a user and move the bike. So yeah, I, I mean, somehow in this, if there was a contract with some agencies, there would have to be some, I, I don't see why there would be a problem giving that to Public Works or PD or whoever would be that. Yeah, I think it ultimately, when we do bring a contract for jump bikes, I think we're gonna wanna look very carefully at the provisions around improperly parked bikes and how those are reported and dealt with. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? Yeah, I have, Sam, I sorry. have a couple of questions. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, on um, um, the old section 10.44, um, there, there used to be, or there are three sections pertaining to licensing of bicycles, which are being eliminated. Um, and that's probably a good thing for private individuals. Um, but a couple of questions. One, I recall one of the reasons why we, we had uh, implemented those sections or one useful part of it was that people could register their bikes uh, with the police department and then if they were stolen, uh, there was a mechanism for kind of um, uh, finding the rightful owners because they were registered bicycles. W will we still be able to do that or are we getting rid of any possibility of doing that? Um, and, um, and my second question is if, um, shouldn't the shared bicycles, uh, the jump bikes, um, won't they be licensed or registered? We'll have some record of what uh, bicycles are in our community, um, and um, and how will that be handled? Uh, will that be handled through the contracting process, since we no longer have a ordinance requiring uh, licensing? So, for the bike share question, um, that would be managed through the contract. So, we would have a set amount of bikes that would be. Um, for Capitola, and then we would just make sure that inventory exists. The licensing of the individual bikes would be complex within a regional system. 
because some trips will start in Capitola and end in Santa Cruz, while other trips would start in Santa Cruz and in Capitola. So the individual numbers for each bike wouldn't work, but the um, through the contract, they'll be required to keep to maintain a certain amount of bikes within Capitola, and they rebalance them each night, and they'll you know move bicycles around and get them back to their communities. So, well, which will. Would that mean that we may not be able to track, um, you know, particular bicycles, um, and um, you know, if they were involved in a in an incident, identify who the rider may have been. Um, so that's what I, I and yeah, it's regional, but I assume the city of Santa Cruz mm -hmm. maintains their list of registered bicycles, and so that they can identify, you know. Uh, each particular bicycle, um, and then ultimately who, who the users may have been? Within the smart technology, they will be able to, um, each, each bicycle has its own identification and they can track the different users. So if it's parked improperly, they can uh, charge a fee to that person, send right. out a warning. So they do have a, everything's tracked individually. So we could, if there were an issue, we would be able to track it through the individual bike. Okay. Yeah. I think we have a comment from the chief. And I think uh, Mayor Bertrand and Council Member Story, I think I might be able to um, provide some information with regard to your first question in bicycle licensing uh, historically. Uh, you're right, Santa Cruz, the city of Santa Cruz uh, maintains a bicycle licensing program, albeit a uh, few number of people take advantage of that. Capitola residents can license their bikes if they choose to in the city of Santa Cruz, uh, and that's been the case for many years. We have uh, licensed over the last 10 plus years less than five bicycles on an annual basis. Okay. Um, Very few. So okay. that doesn't mean, however, that if, if we were conducting an investigation for a stolen bike, of course, our goal is to recover the bike uh, on behalf of the victim. The most beneficial piece of information with that bike is the serial number that I think is stamped on just about every bike anymore. Yeah. Uh, and that's been the case because there have been so few people who take advantage of licensing right. bicycles through okay. mi municipalities. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you, Thank Chief. You. Um, if, if I may, I have a, a couple of more questions. Um, one, uh, under the new section 10.44 under group operation, um, it basically says that bicycle riders, uh, 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 riders of bicycles are, are, uh, are personal transportation devices, uh, must ride in single file. Um, except on paths of parts of a roadway set aside for the exclusive use of bicycles and PTDs. Um, I was wondering how that intersects because I noticed um, sometimes we've seen signage that says that bicycles may use four lanes. Um, and, um, I, and I'm not aware that we have uh, uh, posted roads of that nature where bicycles may basically take up the full lane, maybe side to side abreast, um, and my understanding that that's legal uh, for them to do that. How does that interface with this section that requires them to ride in a single file? We have the chief respond to this. Thank you. Mayor Bertrand, uh, council member story. Let me first talk about the California vehicle code and the language in the code with regard to your question. Where a roadway has a designated bicycle lane, it is very clear in the California vehicle, co vehicle Code that bicycles shall use that bicycle lane, uh, with the exception of four instances, and I'll read them to you from the code so that we're clear. Uh, when the bicycle is overtaken and passing another bi bicycle vehicle pedestrian within the lane or about to enter the lane, if the overtaken and passing cannot be done safely within the bike lane. That's one instance. When preparing for a left turn at an intersection, or into a private road or driveway. They can be outside of the bicycle lane. When reasonably necessary to leave the bicycle lane to avoid debris or other hazardous conditions. And when approaching, when approaching a place where a right turn is authorized. So that's clear in the vehicle code. The vehicle code has no language with regard to bicycles riding in a group versus bicycles riding single file, et cetera. If that answers your question. Um, well, I guess, you know, those instances where you see signs posted that says bikes may use four lanes, um, um, how does that come into play or when is that allowed or authorized? 
Um, is it is it necessary that that be posted, um, that there be su that signage before they can do that, so we can make that distinction? Um, I'm not familiar with the signage, um, okay. but but I'll make an assumption that that signage is necessary when a bike is on a roadway. The vehicle code treats that bicycle just like it does a vehicle, and the rider shall obey all okay. all uh, vehicle code laws. I, I just want to, old San Jose Road has those signs coming all the way down. A perfect example where it does right. say, "Bicycle may use entire lane." And bicycles, what they do, they'll just pull out in front of you, and, and they're allowed to use that lane. Apparently, I mean, it, that's what the sign says. I, th I think our public works director can shed some light on this. He, I know he has experience with the Sharos and uh, this sort of uh, this sort of incident. S so we do have those signs in Capitol actually coming down Wharf Road, um, down the hill. Uh -huh. We have them there. I think they may also may be on Capitol Avenue coming down from okay. the highway. And they're intended um, to empower the bike to take the traffic lane because it's a place where there's no bike lanes and where they are able to ride and take the lane. And it's kind of an advisory more to cars than it is to bikes. It goes both ways. It's really to advise cars that you're going to see bikes in the travel way there so that's the purpose of the signs whether or not they can ride single file or not i think that's that's another issue but that's the purpose of the signs right. and we do okay. have them in capitol okay um well i just think we need to be aware i mean this seems to require that all bicycles ride in single file um, but my experience and my observation is that when they're allowed to use the full lane that they won't and if there's multiple riders you know sometimes they'll be abreast in that lane um, so um, but I'm, I mean we will just have to I, I think uh, exercise discretion uh, in view of this code and and those situations where they are allowed to ride abreast or two across or so and it might be worth mentioning that the vehicle code does make it very clear that it allows local jurisdictions to uh, introduce code that would be more restrictive than the yeah, vehicle code. Right. So, for instance, okay. a code that suggests single file riding in a, uh, on the roadway or in the bicycle lane. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I won't belabor that any further. I did have, I guess, one other minor point or question I'd like to raise. And uh, our old um, uh, code um, and referenced uh, that the traffic regulations apply to persons riding bicycles or animals and we're now deleting animals <laughs> um, and I know it never happens or rarely ever happens and uh, but um, I recall uh, I think one time we had a cowboy ride through town um, and just this past December um, I saw a donkey <laughs> on Capitola Beach um, and so I mean are, are, are we eliminating the reference to animals on the premise that it never happens or so rarely happens. Um, we don't need to enforce the traffic regulations for, um, well, mostly horseback riders. That's correct. So we, we did think this one through and said, you know, there may be the off chance that someone rides a horse through town, but most likely it's going to be associated with a parade uh -huh. um, or a special event. So at this time, we thought it would be appropriate to remove the reference to animals, but it is. Um, they, they would have to follow the rules and regulations of the road if they were on them, and by having it in the code, it protects us from that. So if, if you so choose, we could leave that in the code. Um, well, I, would, I mean, I don't know, Chief, how you feel about um, removing animals from uh, following, you know, the traffic regulations if they should be in town. And uh, you have to signal. And, uh, <laughs> Animals follow traffic regulations better than humans do. <laughs> <laughs> I have no problem uh, removing the language. Removing that. Okay. Uh, then I, I agree with uh, Katie that uh, it would be a special event where typically an animal would be in the roadway and having to follow specific. Okay. Yeah. Then that that fine that answers my concern. Uh, uh, thank you, Mayor. I have no other no further questions. Any other questions? Um, I have a question, sort of a follow up on what Sam brought up in terms of group rides. Um, I think we all know that we have a number of group rides that come through Capitola uh, Saturday morning or Sunday morning. I forget which, you know, th there's many times that I've been downtown and a whole slew of 10 or 20 people go through. So what this is saying that we're not going to allow that anymore. And I sort of have a problem with that. I have nothing against 
group rides, they seem to be fairly well organized. There's a Santa Cruz Bike Club, they might have a group ride that comes through. So um, is there some way we could get around this so that uh, we don't you know, I, I, I would, um, prohibit this? I would suggest that you think of it as a, a means to, for us to police a, your non-traditional group ride. If ever there was a group that wasn't acting and following the, um, that, that wasn't um, being, you know, following the regular rules of the road and they were being mischievous, we'd have a way in which to say, actually, we have a regulation within the code that as group riders, you're supposed to ride single file. And I, I don't think the intent is to pull over the Saturday morning group of 30 that uh, we see go, that probably start off on Westcliff and end up in Aptos and turn, you know, so, um, but, if you don't want it in there, it could be removed. It, it's really a standard. When we drafted the update, I actually took language from the starting point was the Santa Cruz Code, which I think they have more issues with maybe people that aren't always following the r rules when riding with as a group. So this was taken from there, and if we don't have that issue here in Capitola, then we could remove this section. Oh. It was just d for those instances when a group needs to be talked to if, right. if they're so I've seen what you're referring to in Santa Cruz, and it mm -hmm. could be quite uh, wild. Mm -hmm. And so I could understand why Santa Cruz has that rule about no group rides. It's, it's quite wild, to tell you the truth. And um, so they do need some way to deal with it. Um, at least in Capitola, I haven't seen anything like that. And I do know that we have fairly well organized groups that come through Capitola, and I don't want to make that impossible for them. So I would not want to support um, the group ride operation. I don't know what other council members feel. Would it be uh, reasonable to have the wording say something along the lines of all people or all persons shall take reasonable measures to ride in single file, except? I'd rather go to the Bowser. public and then bring it back and then we can have a discussion. Yes. So if you want right. to. I, I take Ed's comment. This is beyond the question and answer. Okay, so at this point, um, I'd like to open to the public for comment. Thank you. Good evening. Council members, mayors, I'm David Fox. I live up at 320 McCormick. I've lived there for 42 years. Um, I want to thank staff for everything it's done on riding this new thing. It's, but at the same time, I would like to point out you're, you're talking about doing a jump bike thing. Do not sign their boilerplate contracts. Keep in mind the city of Capitola. I've been to many places, take Pacific Beach, and their bikes are littered everywhere. Yeah. It, and, and you can't lay it on the police department to take care of this. Their police department down there is just overwhelmed with complaints. They have to take care of the normal police business, not taking care of stupid bicycles left on corners. So when you come up to approving this contract, Keep in mind the city and the people. We're a pedestrian town. We, everybody loves Capitola because it's so pedestrian. So just look out for our, our citizens. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Fox. And you know, according to what you just said, uh, if I may, there's no sidewalks on your street. No. And yeah, I mean, so where are you gonna put it? In front of someone's yard? I mean, yeah, totally understand. Karin, hi. Good evening, Karin Hanna. Um, and I know this is just the ordinance, so I, I, I'm i just expressing some concerns like Mr. Fox. I totally 100% agree with him that this contract is gonna be tricky because um, we already have a problem with bicycles on the sidewalk down in the village. And, uh, you know, there, I don't, there's no, there appears to be no way to enforce that. So if we're going to encourage visitors and people who aren't familiar with the village to, to come down um, and ride into the village, I think that Capitola is one 
and I'm, you know, I'm a cyclist. I ride to work every day. I really know the roads in Santa Cruz County, and I think Capitola Village is one of the most dangerous places to ride a bike if you don't know what you're doing. My daughter fell on Monterey Avenue off her bike, broke her jaw. I don't think any of you remember Dennis Noonan, who was a merchant in the village for quite a long time. He knocked out all his front teeth coming down Cliff Avenue. I mean, it. You know, there you can't get into this village without going down a hill. And if you don't have a helmet, I mean, I even brought my helmet tonight. You know, I mean, I don't leave home without it. Is my uh, my theory. So I think that it's it's a little different than Santa Cruz, and I and I think it's worrisome. But I know you're going to have public hearings on that, and we'll address all that at that time. Um, even the issue of you know, under 10 years old, you can ride on the sidewalk. It's mayhem down there after the junior guards get out, sometimes after school's out. The kids are all over the sidewalks down there. And if you really do have a young child, you know, five or six years old, and the parents are riding with, the parents are going to be in the street with cars in between, and the kids are going to be on the sidewalk. It, anyway, um, we already have a big problem down there, and so if, if and when you get ready to be looking at that contract, um, I hope that you look at it carefully. The merchants are very worried about who do we call when there's a bright red bike parked in front of the store for all day or two days or whatever. And I agree, the police department is not in a position to be responsive to, to every one of those phone calls. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. I don't know if we can be the first city that actually comes up with some answers for some of these problems, but uh, I, th I think it's worrisome. But I, I approve of, the of making the changes so that they don't come as a complete surprise. So I'm supportive of, that, of the changes. I just want to have as much notice and as much uh, information about the possibility as, um, of the jump bikes coming to town. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none, I bring it back to the council for a motion. I was talking a little bit about the um, operation of group bikes, and you did have a comment, Kristen, and I think we left it at that. Um, I still have a problem with prohibiting um, group rides. So that's sort of my stance on that. Any comments from the I have a comment. Okay. Yeah, um, this is uh, just, this is just, we're just trying to adopt an ordinance, okay? There's no bike program, so be clear on that. And we're just working over the language because obviously there will be many hearings and bigger crowds when we start talking about that. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a, a mixed bag because what we're doing, I think I appreciate all the comments by the police chief because what we have to keep in mind first and foremost is the vehicle code because bicycles fall under the vehicle code. And I'm totally against removing any consideration for the group ride because there's no special exemption to the vehicle code. If the group ride's coming through there, they don't own the road, okay? I, I think that they should conform to the vehicle code. Uh, it, I, I've personally seen a group of 40 motorcycles come into the village and they all of a sudden assume that because the first bike has stopped that all the rest of them can just go right on through the stop sign. And I know the chief would tell me that that's not consistent with the vehicle code, but, uh, it, it, but do we enforce that? Probably we don't. I mean, it's something that happens, they go through and it's probably quicker for all 40 of them to go through. But I don't think that we should be making exceptions to encourage a group to come down you know, if they come down as a group and they do their, we see the ride where they come down, I think they, most of them are prudent riders and they're gonna exercise that. But as far as adopting an ordinance, the ordinance needs to be consistent with the vehicle code. So um, I'm for the single file, staying in the bike line. If, if, it, if the uh, sign is already there that's posted that says may use full lane, well then I think that's already a provision for them to use a full lane. I think that uh, you know the part of the vision of the RTC is we're trying to get people out of their cars and uh, on into their bikes and and, and actually make the, the village a, 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 a user friendly place. And so I'm not trying to discourage bicycles by any means, but I, I think it's very important that they need to follow the laws. And being consistent with that, I think we should leave the language in that was added about um, ten year olds. Unfortunately, I don't want to encourage any bicycle to be on the sidewalk, but I don't want to go against federal regulations with what's required. So I was okay with that language that was added. Other than that, all the language that was in there, I was fine with. Any other Mi comments? Is that Mi Kristen? Sam? Mis Mr. Mayor? Sorry. Based on some of the public comment about the children under 10 on the sidewalk, you, we may not want to include the village in that exception. Um, the village sidewalks are quite congested and we already don't allow skateboarding in the village and I'm imagining an eight and nine year old 
um, riding their bike down Esplanade. And in the town I grew up in, in the downtown, you couldn't bike on the sidewalk regardless of your age, just due to the congestion of pedestrians. So I know staff suggested the, the providing the exception for under 10, we may also want to carve out the village. Just wanted to toss that out based on some of the comments that we heard from the public um, and thinking about sort of the level of congestion we see in the summer. I'm not sure that the- What's the legality of that if it's in conflict with federal law? So, so to be clear, that, that, that wasn't federal law, that was federal guidance from the NTSB. So it's the, the NTSB, they'll look at all sort of data and kind of provide best practices, if you will. Okay. And that's basically their advice is, in general, sidewalks are not considered a safe place to ride a bike, except for children under 10, and their data shows that that can't be a safer place. If it's not a law, then I'll retract that. I mean, I, I don't, don't want to encourage bikes on the sidewalk. I thought it was in, we were being compliant with the federal law. If it's just a suggestion, I would say, or I agree with you 100%, absolutely we don't need any bicycles on the sidewalk. So I would strike that, I would be for striking that language. It, so I, what I was suggesting was, you know, maybe in Cliffwood Heights, the sidewalk is an appropriate place for an under 10 year old, but in the village itself. Yeah. That, I'm totally fine with yeah. what you just said, that language, okay. just, just village specific. Can you define village? You know, the way we've defined village in the past for the skateboarding ordinance is effectively the train tracks at Monterey and here on Capitol Avenue, and then the top of the hill at Cliff. The train tracks effectively, um, at Wharf, Cap Ave, Monterey, and then the top of the hill at Cliff. Anything on the bay side of the tra train track? You cross the tracks, you're in the village. Yeah, got it. Okay, um, can, Sam? Can I, yeah, I'm just, um, mm -hmm. that definition, I'm, I'm a little concerned, and I get it down in the village proper, yeah. uh, in front of the stores, uh, but for kids that are riding down Monterey, yeah. which yeah. there's a sidewalk there, I think young children should be able to use the sidewalks instead of going down in the street on that particular street. And so, um, and you know, on uh, Cliff, uh, I mean, there aren't sidewalks there in any event until you get down to uh, closer to Stockton Bridge. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know that that's an issue, but um, I would like to see if we're gonna carve out this exception that we keep that, that hill down Monterey out of the exception so that little kids can use that sidewalk. Maybe we should come up with what a, a pure definitive area for yeah. what the village, because it comes up very often right. and we always are ambiguous about what we call it. So uh, maybe this is a great starting point for finally defining it. Yeah, because I would add that the bridge, Stockton Bridge, should be another place for 10 years old and under two to cross over because yeah, I mean, in thinking about sort of the, the spirit of what we're trying to do, yeah. um, it would seem to me that, I have a map up here on the screen, it would seem to me that, that the, the place where we wouldn't want anyone riding on the sidewalk is the Esplanade, Capitol Avenue between Stockton and Monterey. Not on Stockton. And maybe not on, uh, maybe not on Stockton, and that may be it. What, can the uh, staff come back with a, a definition for us to consider? Sure, sure. I, the question is, can we get through this as a first reading without trying to define it? The idea of kids on on either the sidewalk or on the streets, if we could come up with a definite, you know, Karin came up with a, with something that's actually a very real thing. That it's mayhem there, <laughs> especially after yeah. junior guards. I don't think we should be worried about the first reading. I think we should be worried about finally defining what the village is and taking this opportunity to take the time and direct staff to go back and come back and. Yeah, we should nail this down because you know what? It, it's been very ambiguous for a long time what the village is. So could we tonight then just say the S? We can add the Esplanade Village. I mean Esplanade. I mean that seems to be where we're seeing the most impact of foot traffic, and mm -hmm. everyone seems to agree that that's really where we want not to see little ones on their bikes on on the sidewalks. Yes, we could add the language that it, it does not include, that they'd be prohibited along the Esplanade. Mm -hmm. And Capitola it, Avenue. it would probably make sense to also include Capitola, Capitola Avenue mm -hmm. and that section of Monterey headed towards Esplanade Park. Right. So that. Uh, and Stockton, this uh, short piece between Esplanade 
in Capitola Avenue on Stockton Avenue. That's so can would be my recommendation of the people type. feel comfortable with that for the time being because what Ed brings up is sort of a definition of the village at large, which could be a little bit more like people want to be in the village as opposed to just you know something close to the village. So defining the village, we do have you know within the zoning code and the general plan, we've got the central village um, mm. as a mixed use village within mm -hmm. our general plan it's very defined within the general plan land use map we also have the central village district or it's now the mixed use village under the new zoning code so there's two areas that we define it in terms of land use for this is a, a different exercise you know in terms of skateboards we've defined the village as exactly what um, Jamie, Jamie had stated previously, so it's really for a bicycle if we want people to be able to cross the sidewalk along for Stockton Bridge and to get into the village. I think it, it's different than an exercise of just clearly defining the village. It's where can bicycles travel? Where can a, t a nine year old, where, where do they have to walk their bicycle through the village? Mm -hmm. Should they walk their bike over the Stockton Bridge or down the hill? It's. Um, it's a, so if we want to treat them just like a skateboard. Okay, Ed, come I, I think we. I think this is a great opportunity for us to be consistent. Okay, I don't know why we're trying to resolve this right now. We obviously brought up something that there's some controversy on. Right. And I think that the skateboard ordinance and the bicycle ordinance should be consistent. Why would we want to try to impose two separate ambiguous ordinances, okay? It's hard enough for us to, for the PD to enforce any kind of a skateboard ordinance. And now we're gonna talk about bikes on the sidewalk and we're gonna say, well, no. Stockton is okay up to the bridge, but why would we make it confusing? Why don't we take the take take a step back, come back with a recommendation, and come up have police department weigh in on you know do we want how far do we want them going up Monterey? How far do we want, do we want them going to the trestle? Do we want to assume the trestle? And I don't think we should be just trying to just you know throw in ideas right now. I think that staff should bring us back some some good information. Okay, um, City Council, can we just go along with what Ed said and come back? with a recommendation for later that they've actually thought through and we're not gonna parse it out right now, it's just gonna take too much time. Is that agreeable with everyone? Do we have time to continue this item to um, work on uh, what Ed was talking about? Yeah, so. The, the, the number one pressing issue really is, is the potential scooter dump in Capitola. Um, our existing code does provide the public works director with the authority to remove scooters. It, it's strengthened in the proposed code. Um, so I, I think that we do have some wiggle room. The urgency to bring it forward was to help make it very clear that if we did have a scooter dump, we could impound the scooters. I don't think we're wide open without it. So I do think we could extend it two weeks. Um, okay. And I think, I, I think that's probably a good choice because I think it does deserve some thought, you know, thinking about where's the smoking ban, where's the skateboard ban, where should we say that there's no bikes on the sidewalk? I think it deserves a little bit of thought. Should they all be the same? Or is there a logical reason why they should be different? So uh, we can work with that stuff. If it was June or May and, and when summer was here, I'd be worried about a scooter dump. I, it's not bothering me right now. Okay. So, um, you know, I think Yvette's uh, suggestion was a good one. Just, you know, at least start at the normal, what we think of the village as, and then go from there but you're gonna come back with something and we'll think about it in two weeks, okay? I'd like to also include something about um, uh, bike ride, group bike rides. Um, I am very concerned about that. I agree with uh, Ed that there are cases where we don't wanna see like tons of motorcycles come through town and what that may entail. Um, I think the city of Santa Cruz does have a particular type of problem with group rides. I mean, it's quite rowdy. I've seen it on multiple occasions. Generally speaking, we have very well organized group rides that come through here. They may not be clubs, but they're definitely organized and been going on for years. So I'd like some more thought about that. And I think Ed's point is good. It should be consistent with the state California law. I think everyone on this board would agree with that. So I'd like some definition of that and how we may deviate from that. The police chief did say that we have the option to be stricter. So that would be on the, on the um, docket for us. I have a quick comment. If I'm reading this correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, we could still move forward with the uh, section 10.04. It's just 10.44 that we're having uh, concerns about, correct? So we could still move forward with a motion to 
So I'm gonna go back, back to staff, staff recommendation here. Would you like to make a motion? Uh, well, that's what I'm asking. I'm asking if that's something that, that uh, if I'm correct in understanding, we could still approve the first reading of the ordinance amending municipal code title 10, vehicles and traffic amending chapter 10.04 general provisions and then leave it at that, correct? Because it's 10.44 that has the issues about bicycles on the sidewalk? Correct. Okay, so is that, are we well, okay I'm with not, that? I'm not sure what we would gain by bifurcating um, you know, the particular ordinances and passing one now and well, waiting the only on thing the they're concerned so. about is the is the dumping of the bikes. And I don't know if what we would if what uh, Councilmember Peterson is suggesting would help that. If I mean, I well, I, and, I, and part of the change is actually moving stuff from 10.04 to 10.44. And so, if we don't do that, then I'm kind of confused. I'm kind of confused moving forward. Do you, does that yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, it probably makes sense to move it to look at it all at one time. Okay, so, so that, just wait for so all of it. So 10.04 okay. is still in place. Right now, you're not supposed to ride bicycles on the sidewalk. And then once the 10.44 is adopted and all this information moves into it. Okay, okay. never mind, I, I would take that back. Well, I'd like to make a motion that we continue this item to the next regularly scheduled meeting of the City Council uh, for the staff to work on the various issues that we've raised here this evening. Okay, is there a second? Second. Second. So moved. And, and if my, no, <laughs> Sam. Additional discussion. I, I would like that. I mean, I would like. You know, we're now on the sidewalk issue. Instead of just looking at the village, ask staff to also look at other parts. I mean, because this is a comprehensive citywide ordinance. Look at other locations that we maybe haven't thought of, where um, it um, you know may be appropriate for children to ride on the sidewalk. And may be appropriate not and so that that's my only request so so there's been a motion and second and open for comments okay i do have one comment um that i've been holding back on um we're part of the safe routes to school program and we've been trying to work with the socal school district um, in conjunction with them to make sure that more kids uh, ride their bikes to school and i just happen to live across the street from new brighton and I've noticed since this program has happened that more and more kids are taking bikes to school and they're coming from all over the city from what I could tell. So in the, in the vein of what Sam just said, I, I think this is something kids could be funneling from all over the place. I know they come off of Hill Street, for instance, they're coming over the uh, Highway 1 bridge. So uh, keep that in mind, I think that's important. Okay. And New Brighton being a middle school, yep. the students are gonna be 10 and up. Right, it is 10 up. So, You're absolutely yeah, right yeah. on that. But this is a phenomenon for a lot of kids, not just them. You're absolutely right about yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. No kid at New Very Brighton is yeah. at 10 up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a motion and a second. Uh, who seconded? I did. You did, okay. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, okay. So that gets us back to um, adjournment. Adjourn this meeting. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs>